Good afternoon and welcome to our webcast, What You Need to Know About Cybersecurity in 2022. For those of you who I've not met, I'm Dan Meyer, publisher of BizTimes Media. Thanks for attending today's webcast, which is presented by r, &R Insurance Services and Sikich, and brought to you by BT360 Content Solutions, the marketing storytelling arm of BizTimes Media. You really don't have to search very hard to see news headlines about another cyber attack. This webcast will provide insights into what you can do now to, to protect against an increasingly ominous threat landscape. For security teams on the front lines and those in the business of stopping cyber attacks and breaches, 2021 provided no rest for the weary. And 2022 is shaping up to be another challenging year with emerging threats, including nation states, using cyber warfare to destabilize economies and disrupt supply chains. Small to mid-sized local businesses and individuals are increasingly being targeted as well, and are feeling overwhelmed by the threats facing them. The intent of this webcast is not to scare you, but to make you think more critically about the growing reality of cyber attacks. Our presenters will discuss the following topics. They'll look back at some of the trends in 2021 and why it was a perfect storm for attackers, new threats and challenges in 2022, including insurance industry actions and what it means to customers, today's essential security controls, emerging security solutions and strategies, and more. The slide deck for our program is available now. If you wanna take notes and follow along, you'll find the link in the chat button on your server or on your screen. Later today, a recording of the program will also be available and accessible on our website. At the conclusion, you'll also find an attendee survey and we would appreciate if you filled it out to help us plan for future webcasts. Before I introduce the speakers and continue with the program, I'd like to mention that this marks our 27th year as an independent family-owned business, and BizTimes Media is the only locally-owned business media company in the region, and it wouldn't be possible without your support. Whether it's through our, your consistent readership of BizTimes Milwaukee and our online news features, attending events like this, print or digital advertising, event sponsorships, or through our content studio, BT360 Content Solutions, thank you again for your support. If you're looking to support your sales efforts and grow your business, we welcome the opportunity to work with you to develop a custom marketing program. 
please contact our sales director, Linda Crawford. In addition, our award-winning editorial team is always looking for story ideas, especially if your business is expanding or moving, or you're buying another business or building, or if you have any other news, operational insights, or other information you'd like to share, please let us know so that we can help you tell your story. And almost two years ago, we launched our Insider Subscriber Program. Thank you to all the insiders attending today's program. For the equivalent of $8 a month, you can be an insider and receive several insider benefits, including access to all the content produced by our editorial team. And it's also your opportunity to support local journalism. Before I introduce the presenters, I wanna mention again that the program is being recorded and will be available on demand on our website later today or by tomorrow morning. Uh, before, again, before we get started, we're gonna have a little interact in our interactive session. We have a poll question. If you could please quickly uh, answer this question, what have you done in the past year to prepare uh, for uh, cybersecurity threats? We'll have the uh, answers instantaneously. While you're doing that, I do wanna introduce our presenters. Um, Jason Navarro is the Director of Cyber Crime Insurance at r, &R Insurance. r, &R Insurance is a family owned, uh, is family owned and one of the largest insurance agencies in Wisconsin. With cybersecurity risks at an all time high, Jason and his team will work to mitigate risk and safeguard companies throughout the region. Hello, Jason, and welcome. Hey, Dan, thanks so much for having us. We're uh, excited to be here and present with Kevin. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Our other presenter, presenter is Kevin Bong, Director of Cybersecurity at Sikich LLP. Sikich is a global technology-enabled professional services firm specializing in accounting, tax, advisory, and technology and cybersecurity. Sikich has an extensive knowledge and experience needed to help their clients improve their unique uh, security posture, specializing in compliance audits, penetration tests, computer security assessments, and computer forensic investigations. Hello, Kevin, and welcome. Hi, Dan, thanks. All right, uh, um, Mary, do we have the results of the program? So 30%, I've discussed the issue internally, um, have no real plan. 67% I've discussed uh, have made... Uh, so some, many of you are on your way. And then I know it's an issue, but I've not done anything about it, 2%. Very well, thank you for playing along. So let's now move on to the program. Um, following the presentations, we'll likely have time for Q&A. Uh, please remember to submit any questions you have by using the Q&A feature in your screen. You can also find uh, the link in the slide deck on the chat feature. Again, you can find the slide deck now in the chat feature. If you, if you have questions, please submit. So Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Take Dan. Away. So yeah, we're going to start today talking about some trends that we've seen in 2021. Uh, as Dan mentioned, Sikich does uh, computer security incident response. I lead that team. So we're going to be talking about what we're seeing uh, in the industry. Uh, Jason's going to be jumping in to talk about what he's seeing. Um, so we'll jump right into that next slide. Um, so yeah, 2021, I like to call it a perfect storm for cyber attacks. Um, uh, a big driver of that is, is cryptocurrency and the fact that attackers can um, request uh, you know, six or seven figure ransom and get paid that money instantly, anonymously. Um, it, it's, a big, it's a big driver, but it's not the only driver. We've seen uh, this big shift where people are working from home um, with, the, with COVID um, and that opens up a lot of remote access weaknesses that attackers are taking advantage of. Uh, new vulnerabilities we saw in like 2021, a lot of vulnerabilities that we hadn't seen in the past, or at least types of vulnerabilities, all kind of coming in and all allowing some of these uh, remote attacks. And a lot of that gets tied into, you know, old password practices. Uh, we'll talk about some of the problems with passwords, but uh, we're still trying to teach people how to do good passwords versus passwords that attackers can take advantage of. And Kevin, to bounce off your comments there, I think it's if you put your if you put yourself in the minds of the criminals, exactly what Kevin just said is really how they played and preyed on organizations in 2020 and 21. With all of that going on, they used people who were preoccupied, had other things on their mind. There was a lot going on in the world, and they used that their, to their advantage to trick individuals, to corrupt individuals, to get them to make the mistakes which allowed access to their organization. So as, as Kevin said, 
it was the perfect storm because people were so preoccupied with many other factors that allowed the criminals a much easier time to get in. Next slide, please. Um, so talking about kind of some of those new vulnerabilities or what was unique about 2021, um, a lot of uh, small businesses that we worked with who had, had compromises, it, it, it originated from uh, their firewall or other kind of internet perimeter device um, basically not being patched. Uh, we saw just a, a run of vulnerabilities in these perimeter routers, firewalls that small businesses were using uh, across a lot of different brands. You know, you see uh, Cisco and Sonicwall and Palo Alto and Zyxel, like almost every manufacturer had some vulnerabilities in 20 and 2021. And the small businesses don't think, they think about patching their workstations, their Windows computers, but they don't think about patching that firewall. And, you know, as they started to use VPN more, uh, the, that combination of missing patches and VPN users just, just added a lot of attack surface for attackers. Uh, next slide. Another kind of unique uh, happening in 2021 is a Microsoft Exchange Zero Day. So if you're not familiar with the Zero Day or a Zero Day vulnerability, what that means is that there are zero days between when people know about the virus or the vulnerability and when the attackers are using it on the internet. And in this case, actually, you know, there was attacks in the wild against companies uh, in January, but people didn't even know about the vulnerability until like March. Um, so that's, it's a zero day, they're scary. Uh, it's especially scary here because it was a zero day in Microsoft Exchange, a really popular, um, uh, well-used uh, uh, and, and long time used uh, mail server. Uh, a lot of small businesses had an exchange server facing the internet um, and it was compromised even before there were patches available. And this one is uh, scary too, that we saw where exchange servers were compromised in March, um, but nothing really happened other than the, the bad guy got a foothold. And then the business patched the mail server late March, as soon as patches became available. And months later, like August, September, October, the attackers were coming back and, and actually making use of that back door to do a ransomware attack or something like that. So, you know, months and months later, even after they'd patched, uh, you know, they didn't know they'd already been breached and someone was kind of lying in wait. Yeah, and, and Kevin, this is, a, this is another great strategy that the criminals really use. And, and we unfortunately had to deal with multiple incidents here from our customers in Wisconsin with this, not just on the Microsoft Zero Day Exchange server, but there were other programs and software packages that the criminals, they'll get into as those programs are being manufactured and developed and created. They'll put their back doors in them. And so that when the customers roll those out and you as the end user buy that, it's in your program that you already have purchased that you don't know about. And so exactly as Kevin mentioned, by the time you find out about it, they've already been in, they've already got access. They can then do with you as they want, whenever they want. It's a really scary situation. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. I think we're gonna, is this the poll question? Maybe Kevin or, or yeah, Jason, so. you can, you can yep. walk us through this poll question to set up the next. Uh, yeah, if you wanna pop it up. So yeah. Um, kind of looking through this, what are, what are some of the, the things that you see as a risk um, or challenges to, to facing some of the risks we've talked about? I think this is a trick question. <laughs> yeah. Let's see how they do. Looks like they're pretty much settled in on all the above. Yeah, yeah. Certainly we're seeing across all those. Yep. Yeah. And and I think one of the things to, to, to realize or to think about is, is with cybercrime, there's no one strategy that the criminals will use every single day, right? They will constantly evolve. They will constantly change up the types of attacks. And you have to be prepared for multiple different avenues of how you get attacked. And, and so you have to think about it from IT defense. You have to think about it from internal controls. You have to now, unfortunately, think about the ransom activities and, and all that goes along with ransoms. And it's a multi-pronged approach. And so that's what we really want to stress and, and, and get customers thinking about is that it's not just one thing that you have to plan for. Yeah. So now we'll jump to, we kind of talked about some of the key things in, in, that have happened. Now we're going to talk about what we see happening here in 2022. Uh, next slide, please. 
So yeah, certainly we're seeing uh, growth. And Jason, you might want to jump in and talk about this on the nation state attacks. Yeah, and so this is one that, you know, it's obviously been in the news tremendously within the last 30, 60 days with everything going on in Russia and the Ukraine, right? Russia has a state-sponsored government organized cyber division that use cyber warfare as a military tactic. Um, there have been absolutely attacks that have been targeted toward Ukraine. Um, the United States government, CISA, the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, who is, is the defender of the United States when it comes to it, they've been putting out bulletins almost on a weekly basis that uh, the ramifications of what's going on over in Russia and the Ukraine, the way our internet is all connected and in, in, in malware and viruses spread. And so the United States government is so concerned about this that they're, they're warning local organizations here regularly to say, you've got to be prepared for this. You've got to understand how nation states attacking others can ultimately find its way over to us. Um, just even an hour ago, there was a bulletin that I got that um, the United States posted a bulletin that Russian cyber uh, warfare was trying to specifically attack the electrical grid here in the United States. They're aware of it. They're working with electrical organizations, right? You saw last year they targeted the Colonial Pipeline. They targeted meat packers, right? Um, just about a month ago, they hit logistics. There's a pattern here, right? They're going after systematic strategic infrastructure in the United States and all around the world. They're doing that from a warfare tactic, right? And so eventually they test run, eventually they get in, but then the downstream of, uh, impacts every everybody, including businesses, people, and, and, and things like that. So there's a specific reason they do this because it creates fear and it's also successful to generate income, which is one of their main goals here. So uh, the last thing with propaganda there, it spreads fear, right? Fear leads to uncertainty and doubt. Um, that gets a lot of people worked up. And you know, if you're at this presentation, you're obviously concerned about cyber. It gets in your head and it spreads. So it's definitely targeted and it's done for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you you touched on it, but the, the funding, the the you know, even if you're not running a, an electrical grid, you know, your company is you know manufacturing widgets. Um, you're still a target because they just want to get in and do a ransomware uh, attack so they can fund their military, fund their activities, fund their terrorist activities. Next slide, please. Yeah, and the other thing that we continue to see a growing array of, we call them threat attack, uh, tactics and techniques. Um, kind of here's the, the matrix that, that the industry uses to kind of track this. And you can see, um, you know, it's, it's built into columns around what are the different things that the attacker is trying to do. They're doing reconnaissance, trying to figure out who are good targets. Uh, they're gaining initial access, like how did they get that foothold? They're gaining persistence. They're putting in back doors, command and control channels, um, you know, escalating privilege, getting admin access, getting access to your backups. And, and so they've got lots of tools and techniques to do each of these things um, across all kinds of different networks. And, you know, it gets a little scary being on the defense side, you know, especially for a small business, like how do I put in controls to stop each of these tools and techniques, you know, starts with the question. We'll talk about some of those tools and things like that, but this just kind of reinforces um, the breadth of the, the attacks that people are facing today. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the more, you know, kind of advancing tactics and techniques we're seeing, everybody's familiar with like email phishing uh, and pretty keyed into that, not likely to fall for things, but attackers are stepping that up. We're seeing a lot of SMS text scamming. You know, a, a great example there is maybe your um, Venmo or bank account or something like that. Um, you know, you log in with your username and password, uh, but then you get an S, a text a number as an SMS text on your phone. That's a second factor you have to type into in to log in, you know, a six digit number. Well, the attackers will, what they'll do is they'll call you up and say, hey, this is your bank. We think someone's trying to log into your account. We want to secure it. I'm going to send you a six digit passcode. Uh, when you receive that, read it off to me so I know you're who you say you are and then I can secure your account. Well, you think they're the bank and you read off that number when it's actually the attacker who had just, you know, tried to log into your, your account and needed that number to log in. Um, so lots of SMS text scamming, just basically like that social engineering, but even stepping up where maybe they're not even calling you, they're calling your phone num phone company, your cell phone company, and, and pretending to be you and getting your phone switched over to a device that they have. That's called a SIM swapping.
But then when that SMS text code goes out, it doesn't go to your phone, it goes to their phone. So we're seeing that kind of advanced things that, that includes the pretext calling. I just talked about them calling up to try and get you to disclose a, co a code. And I even have a, a screenshot here. Um, people are using Microsoft Teams or you know, we're using uh, uh, Zoom, I think, for this, this recording, this meeting here. All of those social, uh, socialization apps have chat functions and it's getting easier and easier for attackers to weasel their way in uh, into a trusted chat and make you think you're talking to someone within your company or somebody you know, getting you to click on links, giving you to disclose information. So yeah, that, that social engineering is, is spanning pretty much every channel that you interact with computers or with other people. Right. One of the things we see a lot with this, Kevin, is, is you know, is the criminals will target down to the employee level. They will actually do research, as Kevin mentioned, with the reconnaissance. They will stalk you on, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. They'll know all about you and they'll find out the individuals who are very social pro prolific posters and talk about things specific to them that nobody else should really know. They'll then use that in these chat features. They'll use that in specific emails targeting you at work. The goal is to get into your organization. While most businesses have done a great job on trying to secure and put updates in from an IT standpoint, your weakest link is always your people. And getting an individual to fall for that scam using social engineering is much easier than trying to beat someone like Kevin, who's who's fortifying your castle and putting up IT defenses. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. We've had multiple uh, companies reach out to us in the last year and say, hey, I think our network has been breached because we're getting phishing attacks, we're getting pretext calling attacks, or we're getting um, like unemployment fraud. And these attackers know too much about our employees. They know what their job role is. They know all their contact information. They know their birth date. Um, they must have hacked our systems because how else did they get all this information about our employees? <clears throat> and we're coming back and saying, you know what? It's happening to everyone. The attackers are just really getting good at that reconnaissance through, we call it open source intelligence, being able to go out to the web, out to Facebook, out to all these other sources and figure out who are you, what's your job, what's your birth date, where do you live, and, and know all this stuff about you to, to make their attacks seem more credible. Yeah, you've got really, you've got a couple generations. You've got the younger generation in life here who likes to post everything and anything about where they go, where they eat, when they're on vacation, when they're leaving. I don't need to know. I mean, you think about it on Facebook or even if you're, if you say, hey, I don't use Facebook and Twitter, go to your LinkedIn page. LinkedIn gives you the opportunity to tell me the city you live in, the birth date, your birth date, your high school, your college, I don't need to know all of that, right? And, and the criminals will use that specifically to target your interests, your likes, pretend to be someone that you went to college with, and they use that against you. And so we're not saying that you shouldn't post information on social media, furthest thing from that, but certain information I don't need to know. You don't need to give me access to that. And if you do, you're just making it a lot easier for, for the criminals to gain access to your organization. Dan, next slide, slide please. Um, and yeah, here just to, to talk a bit about what is the impact once, once someone's had, especially one of these ransomware attacks. So the way these typically work, I've been talking about ransomware, haven't really defined it, but what an attacker does is uh, they get a foothold on your network. Maybe that's through a phishing attack to get a password. Um, Maybe it's through a virus that you, you opened and, and got by your, your antivirus or something like that, but they're getting access to like one VPN account, one remote desktop account, uh, or one PC on the network. Uh, from there, they, they lurk, they do that privilege escalation I talked about where they can get admin, admin credentials, where they can get to backups. Um, and then they'll go and get ready and they'll you know log in and delete the backups. And that night they'll, uh, launch a payload that starts encrypting all the data on the servers. Uh, so when you come in, typically Monday morning, you come in Monday morning, uh, you boot up your computer, you go to open the Excel spreadsheet you work on every Monday morning, and it's not there anymore. Instead, this encrypted file is there with a note that says, hey, your data is encrypted. Send us some Bitcoin if you want us to decrypt it. Um, so that's, that's the experience when it starts. But it's huge when that happens. Suddenly you're not able to work, your manufacturing floor is down or whatever it is you're trying to do, you can't do. Um, you know, If they were successful, the attacker may have deleted your backup. So you lose that chance to recover. Um, you're trying to respond and de decide if you need to pay a ransom demand. You're trying to figure out which systems are infected. Um, and the attacker's always like two steps ahead of you at this point. They've got what they call shaming sites. I've got a screenshot here. Uh, where they're like, hey, we just broke into this 
this company this morning, uh, here's 5% of the data we stole from them. If they don't pay their ransom by tomorrow, we're going to post the other 95%. Um, and, 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 and that, you know, so it's, it's huge the impact on a company, not just the ransom. And one of the other things to, to think about is, are, am I legally allowed to pay that ransom? There is a whole bunch of not only legal issues, but PR issues. There's things that you must understand and you have to follow exact guidelines when that ransom situation happens. And, and that's on you as the business because taking the wrong action or making the wrong decision not only brings civil but criminal prosecution to it if you go the wrong way. And so you need to understand there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just, well, let's obtain some Bitcoin and pay this to, to, to get our information back. The other big thing here is that we'll get a lot of people that will come and say, you know what, as Kevin mentioned in this scenario, maybe they deleted your backups, but let's say they don't. Let's say they don't delete your backups and you say, okay, no big deal, right? I've got, I've, I've got my backups offsite, they're air gapped. I'm not gonna lose any information. It's not a big deal. The act of obtaining or breaching your systems and getting that information in the first place to all your customers, suppliers, vendors, employees, whoever they gained it on, that creates a legal liability issue for you, regardless if you have lost the information or not. It's been, as Kevin say, uh, shows here on the shaming sites, if they post that information and steal it and post it, now any one of those individuals or organizations has the right to come after you for anything that happens to them. You know, their credit's ruined, loans are taken out, um, you know, whatever those criminals do to them, that ultimately comes back to you. So it's a, it's a question we get a lot that, well, my backups are fine, it's no big deal. There's still more that goes into it. And so we want to make sure people are aware of that. It's not just a backups issue. Uh, Dan, next slide, please. So Kevin just, you know, told you a lot from, from Kevin's world, who's really hands-on and, and, and can, you know, not only work to fix the issue, but you know, really get in and understand what's going on from an IT side. It should, it should get you thinking about all that's going on, right? And what we want you to realize is that there's so many different ways that you can be attacked nowadays. And for the last three, four, five years, many companies chose to take out insurance as a financial risk transfer, really the money to pay for these incidents, right? And so what I want people to think about is, you know, whether you have an insurance program or not, what you should be thinking about is, okay, where are we now? If I walk in, as Kevin said, on Monday morning and our systems are completely locked down and, and everything is, is, we're shut out, what do we do? Who do we call? Where do we go, right? The purpose of the insurance is not only to provide the financial backing, but realistically and more important to provide all of the service providers that have the game plan and you've in essence got them on retainer, whether that be legal, remediation, repair, forensics, extortion teams to handle the ransom. All of those teams come in and take over the situation for you. And, and that's really critical for people that say, okay, who do I call or where do I go? And in the last year specifically, the carrier's loss ratios have gone from right around 100%, meaning every dollar they take in, they're paying about a dollar out to the current loss ratios on cyber are over 160% right now. And so they're underwater. And in with all the frequency and the severity that we're seeing in the news in, in pretty much every day with all the claims we deal with, it, 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 it makes sense, right? And, and the numbers do match. And so the carriers have had to take some pretty specific underwriting actions as a result of that. And what they're doing now is they are making harder underwriting decisions. They are really scrutinizing companies to not only just you say, hey, fill out this application, you pay a premium, you get insurance, what it's been the last couple of years. Now it's, we need to make sure that these customers that we're going to insure have the IT controls upfront in place before we're willing to insure them. And so what some of those things are now are quite challenging for customers. Um, and, and it did get rammed down customers' throats for lack of better term, pretty quickly. The, the big ones that we're seeing right now that most people are having to deal with are multi-factor authentication. That pretty much is a mandatory requirement in order to obtain an insurance policy now. As we continue to go on, and some of the things we're going to talk about in Kevin's slides here coming up, um, some new tools and technology that you'll see, endpoint detection, encryption, backups. I'm not going to go into it too much now because we're going to talk about it in a little bit. But more upfront IT controls are being required in order to obtain cyber insurance. And some of these things do take time to implement, so it needs to be on your mind. The other thing right now is the pricing because of all those losses 
has gone up significantly. It is a challenge not only to obtain the insurance, but the insurance premiums are up significantly over what they've been in the past. And the forecast from all the actuaries because of what's projected to come the next 12, 24 months from a loss activity standpoint is just through the roof. The premiums in these requirements are only gonna continue to go up. The other last piece here that I wanna talk about that's pretty interesting and, and, and pretty cool from really when you, you think about it, but the carriers now are using predictive analytics uh, and they're using artificial intelligence hacking tools for lack of better term. Um, some of these programs that can scan your systems up front, they know more about you than you will ever fill out in an application. It can look to see what software programs you're using, what versions, do you have open ports? Um, are you leaving old websites up that gave, give backdoor access into your, into your network, right? And so it, not only are the carriers using these to make underwriting decisions, but let's say Kevin's your IT team, you can now, the carriers will share that information with you. And let's say you forgot about something or you've just made so many changes lately, um, you didn't realize this was an issue. Now you can give that to Kevin and say, Kevin, can you help me fix this, right? Or we've got some areas here that we need to, to update and, and get better on. So the, the cyber insurance industry as a whole is much more sophisticated than it's ever been and it's continuing to go that way. It is challenging for customers at the current time, but if you go this route, there is a reason that the carriers are taking so much time. It's because the amount of money that's going out on a continuous basis with the claims frequency and severity, they want to do what's best for the customers because ultimately it's good for them as well. So um, there's a lot going on and why it matters to you is because if you choose to go down this route, there is thought that needs to be put in place before you say yay or nay that we want this cyber program. Next slide. I'd like to circle back to that later, but uh, I think we have another poll question if you two can walk us through it. Sure. I'm gonna let Kevin yes. jump on this one. <laughs> yeah, so just the question here, uh, a, lot of t a lot of folks, uh, especially small businesses, would slow to implement multi-factor authentication. Uh, we thought it'd be good to get a sense where for the attendees here, where people stand. Are they using it now on their important accounts or their business accounts? Um, and and how's, the, how's the experience with that? I'm using right. MFA with little negative impact, so. A little, bit, a little bit more right? than half on the little negative impact, which is which is what I'd expect. Some people still feel it's a hassle. I think by and large, people are seeing it's less of a hassle than they maybe thought it would be that they dragged their feet, at least businesses dragged their feet putting it in place. Um, uh, yeah, this is pretty typical. I, I agree. I think I think that the numbers are pretty much what, what we see is, you know, generally about 30 to 40 percent of businesses have been able to implement it so far as kind of the numbers that we would use. And, and, and as we're talking to people about implementing it, it, it jives. And you have to have it for certain kinds of insurance or all cyber insurance. Yeah, so it's it, really it, not an option. Going forward, right? Yeah. So yeah, and that, that's a good lead into the next slide here on today's essential security controls. Uh, so before we get into that, like, so when I'm talking with a, a business leader shortly after a breach, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot of the same trends of, I wish I had known that before the breach. The top one always is that multi-factor authentication would have was so easy to implement. And, and the reason I say it that way is, you know, uh, usually the business has been talking for two or three years with their service provider or with their their IT team about we should have multi-factor, but uh, we haven't put it in place yet. It's on the to-do list. You know, reasons they haven't done it. And a lot of times, within one or two days of having a breach, um, it's in place. You know, everybody's on board, like we should have had it. I wish we hadn't. Uh, we're going to put it in place before anybody can get back in the network. And suddenly it's in place and it was easy and nobody was that impacted. So, yeah, it's, it, we're, we're really at a point today, you know, three, four years ago, I would have said most people should really be thinking about multi-factor authentication. Today, it's, it's a must. If your company doesn't use multi-factor for things like VPN or even for email access, we see a lot of attacks nowadays start with what we call an email account takeover. Um, you don't think about how much an attacker can get to if they took, take over one mailbox. Uh, mailboxes are used for password resets for business applications. They contain social security numbers, credit card numbers, uh, lots of information that's great for social engineering, for like uh, financial fraud, uh, ACH wire, things like that. 
So yeah, multi-factor, it's a must nowadays on any remote access and any email access for your business. And some people say, you know, what's really the big deal, right? Why, why do I need to do this? It, it takes so much extra time. It's kind of a pain in the butt, right? So if you gave Kevin 10 minutes, right? And, and Kevin had some nefarious activities going on and he, his intentions changed. It's pretty easy for, for a hacker to find your passwords. Um, people use the same login and, and they use their work email for multiple sites. They use it for LinkedIn, Amazon, Target. Eventually those, those sites will get breached. Um, and I've seen Kevin do this in real life. He did it on our organization, but he can go out and find on the dark web. He can find everybody in your organization that used their work email address and the password associated with it. And the likelihood of somebody using that same password combination at the office or at another site is very high. And the reason not only the insurance industry is recommending multi-factor authentication, but IT folks are recommending it is because in the grand scheme of things, it's easy to obtain a password. It's much harder for those criminals to obtain not only your password, but your phone or your fingerprint or your eye scan or your, you know, a badge reader. It makes it more challenging. Does it make it impossible? But the whole purpose of MFA is to make it harder for criminals to gain access. And you just heard Kevin say that your that one email in, uh, inbox or account gives him the holy grail to your organization, right? And so that's the why behind it. It makes it harder for criminals to, to attack you. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, next one here that my backups weren't so nope, see, I'm saying the same slide. My backups weren't safe from hackers. So yeah, uh, we see a lot of organizations that, you know, uh, six years ago, uh, replaced all their backup tastes with a new like, hey, we bought this disk appliance that just stores our backups on site there, you know, it's, it restores it backups fast, it backs up fast, it restores fast, uh, not realizing it's just another computer on the network and the attacker can log into it and with a few keystrokes delete all the backups on that computer. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about some steps to protect backups from hackers, but that's been a problem. These, these ransomware attacks uh, aren't like a, a tornado where just because your, your data is in a different state means it's safe. Uh, you have to have it safe from the, the attacker who's stolen all your password. Is a cloud backup safer? Yep, cloud backups, are, cloud backups are definitely one of the best ways to protect from this. Um, so many antivirus gaps. So yeah, people deploy antivirus, they're paying their antivirus licenses every year. Uh, but you know, come, come the time we're looking to the investigating the attack, we're like, yeah, uh, the attacker sat for a month on this development server or this other server that never got antivirus installed because they never got around to it or, or, or things like that. Or the attacker got it on this workstation that didn't have antivirus. You know, it's, it's one of those things where people deploy it and it ends up being on 90% of the computers and working fine. Uh, but if you don't have 100%, you're leaving holes the attackers take advantage of. Uh, the next one, how easy it was to get admin access to basically own the network after just infecting one computer or, or stealing one set of user passwords, getting to one email box. You know, you saw that big grid of different tactics and techniques. Two of the biggest columns in that grid are the different ways attackers go from having one user account to owning the network, to having admin access. Uh, there's just lots and lots of ways that they can do that. And they're usually successful at it. Um, and then finally, uh, how poor logging was configured. Um, for Windows, for a Microsoft Windows network, uh, the default logging settings for what we call the security event logs typically only store about two days worth of logs. Uh, and that's just because the default setting is trying to save disk space. Um, but in a, in, a, in a breach, that doesn't, you know, you, when I'm investigating a breach and you ask me, well, when did they get in? How long they've been here? How did they get in? And I look at your event logs and they only go back to Saturday and it's Monday. I, I can't answer that question. We don't have those logs anymore. Um, people don't ever look at that stuff until after a breach happens. Next slide, please. So this gets us to kind of what I call kind of the, the doing the basics well. You already know about these security controls. You know, we've talked about multi-factor authentication, but yeah, you just have to have it in place for any remote access. That's remote desktop, that's VPN, that's even into cloud applications that, uh, you know, have customer data or sensitive data in them. Uh, and that's email. Um, the next one is commercial antivirus installed everywhere. So that's talking about that 100% of computers have it. Uh, but then also the other key things there is commercial. So don't just use the antivirus that came pre-installed with your computer. That's kind of a lower end one, especially if you didn't pay 
uh, to extend it or upgrade it or things like that. Um, you know, I call them bells and whistles, but it's it's the the better commercial ones have features that are like a built-in firewall, uh, threat detection, um, you know, monitor your browsing, all things like that. So so get a commercial antivirus and then don't turn those things off. Keep them turned on. They actually do a lot to protect you against these tools and techniques that the attackers are using. Um, the next one's patch management. So at a business, you know, you might think that Windows is updating its patches, which is good, but you know, uh, are your browsers or other applications getting updated? How are your firewalls or other net network equipment getting updated? Because those, again, patches, missing patches in those systems can lead to problems. Uh, the next one here, passphrases. So this is where I get a little bit of a soapbox. Uh, for the past, you know, what is it, 20 years, uh, us here in the IT industry have been teaching everybody terrible password practices. And those terrible password practices is, you probably know it, eight characters, with a mix of letter numbers and symbols. And we told you that was a strong password, use that, that combination. It's actually a terrible password. It's a terrible password because it's hard for a human to remember. I've got an example here. It's the word Spartans with some leet speak. So, you know, the S returned, uh, replaced with a five and the A replaced with an at, but you're not gonna easily remember that. Like which characters did I replace? And was it an uppercase or a lowercase and all that kind of stuff hard for a human to remember. So they're writing it down, they're reusing the same password, <laughs> bad, bad practices, but it's actually easy for a computer to guess that password. Um, if, if I were able to catch your login process kind of as it goes over the network encrypted um, and it had an eight character password like that, uh, we've got a computer in our office that can crack that password, can get to the original password in 48 hours, in two days, uh, no matter how complex it is, if it's just eight characters, uh, we can guess that password in 48 hours if we get the encrypted version of it. Um, so what the recommendation from the industry now is passphrases. And we call them passphrases. It's really a, a password of 15 or more characters. But the rules are different. The rules are try and build something long, but don't worry about complexity. Don't worry about symbols and numbers. Maybe put them in there if you want. Um, it's really just about having it long and, and interesting and unique. You know, I've got flying purple snail gallon. Um, easy for a human to rem remember. Um, you know, picture a, a, a purple snail uh, with a 10 gallon hat and wings flying through the air. And a year from now, I'm gonna ask you what that password was. You're gonna think of that snail and you're gonna remember that password. Um, but because of the length, because it's just not eight characters, but I don't know how many characters, uh, we jump to thousands of years for a computer to be able to break that password. You know, when, when you think of passphrases, you know, think most most words in the English language are at least four letters long, right? And so look out the window and think of the, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind, you know, something like, you know, windy days drive me crazy, right? That That's about 20 characters, but you won't forget that to Kevin's point. And the computation is, is Kevin's secret computer in his back room that's going to break into your office. As he said, you're playing the lottery, right? It's 26 letters plus 10 numbers, plus 10 special characters. So it's basically 46 times 46 times 46 times 46. The longer you make that, the harder it is for that computer and the longer in terms of years to break in. So I 100% agree with Kevin's comment here and, and, and pick a passphrase that's easy for you to remember, but something that's unique and it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, the next one is uh, system hardening. Nope, oh, we're still, uh, stay on the side a bit longer. System hardening. So that's just about, you know, I talked about how easy it was for attackers to gain admin access. Most of the time, what they're taking advantage of is what we call weak system hardening settings, like default settings in Windows that cause uh, Windows to disclose an encrypted password in a certain situation, or to allow someone to, you know, query the, the, the network to figure out usernames on the network and start password guessing. You know, there's a lot of very specific settings you can change on Windows or whatever system you have that make it a lot harder for the attackers to get admin access once they have a, have a foothold. Um, phishing awareness exercises, there's nothing more than effective at, at, at teaching your employees not to click on or fall for phishing attacks than sending them a phishing attack every quarter. Um, you know, when, when companies sign up for these services that do this phishing awareness exercises, the first time they're gonna get, you know, 10, 20, 25% click-through rate of people falling for it. After just a few cycles of that, you know, a few quarters, uh, it's down to maybe one or two people, you know, less than 4% uh, 
click-through rate. People learn very quickly when they're getting fished regularly. Um, and finally, cyber reliability insurance. And Jason already kind of covered the value of that, but I would, I would reinforce there, um, you know, that insurance is not just to pay the ransom. That insurance helps you respond. Um, we actually, when we work with a company that's, that says, hey, sick itch, please help. We've had a ransomware attack. We, we have two packages we come to them with. We say, uh, do you have cyber liability insurance? If they say yes, we're going to say, okay, here's the package of doing it right. That includes a, a root cause investigation. That includes you know, checking across your network to make sure it's clean. That includes assistant, assistance recovering things, you know, the, the legal assistance, all that kind of stuff. If you say, no, I don't, we, we, we have this other package that's basically what's the bare minimum because we already know you're hurting and doing everything right is going to be really expensive. And, and that's a lot of pocket. Insurance to help with that, you're probably going to make some, you're going to choose to cut some corners where maybe you can cut some corners. Because yeah, at that point, it's out of pocket, isn't it? Yeah. If, yep. if you don't have any insurance. In, in some of those, that, that, that's hands down the hardest. I mean, obviously, right, I'm in the insurance business. I, I'm, I'm very pro people buying a policy that helps them in their time of need, right? Hands down, some of the hardest conversations I've had in the last two years are with customers who have chosen not to take it and get into that situation. As Kevin said, you're in a world of hurt. Your, your entire operation is usually shut down. Um, I've had people crying on the phone talking to me, right? And, and as Kevin said, you're trying to get them up and running as quickly as possible. You're pointing them to people that can help them at that time, right? So the insurance is, is really, it's the financial backing, but as Kevin said exactly, it's there to provide the service matter experts, regardless of which field they're in or who you need to be a part of your team at the time of need. It's the go to war team is what I call it against the bad guys to help you get out of that situation. Quick thing here on this slide, for those of you who are, are taking notes or you're thinking about insurance, this slide here, this is the table stakes at the current moment, just to sit down and obtain cyber insurance. These, when you say, what do we need to do? How do we get prepared to, to be in a position to obtain cyber insurance? If you look at these key categories here, this is the minimum it's gonna take. What we're gonna talk about on the next couple of slides here is where the industry is going, but focus on this page and these next couple if you wanna be in a position to obtain or keep your cyber insurance. Next slide, please. Yeah, so as, as Jason said, we're gonna kind of talk about what's, what's new, what's coming, what should be on your radar to at least understand and know about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first one, endpoint detection and response. You might hear this term EDR, or endpoint detection and response. This is really the next generation or the, the next thing coming to replace antivirus. Um, it's kind of like antivirus. You install it on your computer instead of antivirus in most cases, uh, but it's, it's, it provides more than just blocking viruses. It provides advanced firewalling. You know, this is a great way if you've got uh, work from home employees now that are full-time work from home, and you want the same type of firewall security that they, when they work from home is that they would have from the office. An EDR solution can, can provide that. Uh, provide things like application whitelisting. So it doesn't just say, don't run applications that look evil. It says only run applications that we've checked and are approved. Um, host intrusion monitoring. So it's looking for behaviors on the computer that look like that bad guy trying to ele ele uh, elevate privileges or set up command and control channels or or steal or encrypt data. Um, so yeah, it's just when you hear EDR, it's kind of the new, the new hotness that used to be antivirus with a lot more features that are really effective at stopping these ransomware and similar attacks. In fact, so effective that a lot of times, uh, you know, kind of that uh, doing it right, if you've had a ransomware breach, uh, we here at Sikich and most other companies, uh, one of the first things we'll do in response is deploy one of these EDR solutions across your network if you don't already have one, because it's the best way for us to find all the hosts that have been infected and clean them up. Uh, the next one, protecting backups. Um, so we talked about putting them in the cloud. You know, usually there's MFA in the cloud um, or putting them back offline. You know, if you're really small, maybe that's two USB drives, one that's always on the shelf, one that's plugged in and you swap them out every night to do backups um, or, or going back to tapes or putting that expensive backup system, uh, we call it in a hardened enclave onto a, a network uh, segment that's behind multi-factor, that even if the attacker had all your network passwords, they can't get to that network segment, they can't get to the backup server or the disk drive that holds it or things like that. 
Hey, Kevin, real quick, one of the questions that came in just uh, hit on that topic on backups and specifically it said, you know, one of my clients feels cyber insurance isn't necessary because they have everything backed up in the cloud. Can you discuss issues with the cloud? And, and so one thing I'd, I'd want to, to stress there to, to make people think about, right, is it's great. As Kevin said earlier, putting backups in the cloud definitely helps, right? There's a lot of good there. Two points, though, to consider. One, there's nothing saying that that cloud content can't be encrypted itself or can't be attacked or breached. That provider that you're working with can't be impacted, which ultimately does come back to you uh, that you may not be able to access that information. The second thing is that even if the cloud, uh, the information gets there and is obtained by the criminals in any way, your act of uploading it to the cloud ultimately comes back to you from a liability standpoint. So while it may be safer, while it may be more up, there may be more updates, it's, it definitely has controls around it. You have to realize from a liability aspect that anything you engage with from a third party provider ultimately still is your responsibility. So you really wanna do your due diligence with the, the firms that you engage with contracts because anything you put there is your responsibility so kevin but i'll let you add anything from yeah. the it standpoint on, on the cloud yeah yeah they're they're they're, they're not they're, they're up a right path in that most by and large ransomware attacks are are hitting on-premises systems so your your servers in your office your workstations in your office things like that less less commonly do they impact cloud services but um they still do sometimes impact cloud services and I think we're going to see a growth of that as, as the industry, the IT industry is moving more to the cloud, uh, the attackers are just going to piggyback on that. And, you know, maybe today, um, you know, I, I have to get by your firewall and I have to get by a bunch of other things on your network to get to the data on your network. Actually, to get to that data in the cloud, maybe all I need to do is to trick one person and get their second factor authentication. And now I've, I can download, you know, I can go through all the screens in the cloud and download all your customer information if that's a customer service rep or something. So, you know, um, yeah, there's less ransomware in the cloud, but there's still breaches of cloud accounts we're seeing pretty regularly. Um, very quickly, the last bullet here, filtered outbound traffic, blocking malware and command and control. You know, this is where I talked about, um, you've got the attackers, once they get a foothold, they need to establish that foothold, keep it, get, get instructions from the attacker. And you've got another opportunity, not just the workstation, but the perimeter device, that firewall, to find them, to block them. If you've got it configured right, and that configured right means web content filtering, blocking uncategorized categories, denying all the other protocols. There's no reason your business computers need to be able to talk the Fortnite gaming protocol or whatever other protocols there are going out from the network. Um, settings you can change to make that that tighter. Next slide, please. And then the last slide of more new security controls to know about uh, protected DNS. Um, what this does is you, most people point their DNS at their, their ISP like uh, Charter or, or whoever it is, um, or they point their DNS at Google or someone like that. But there's services out there that provide what's called protected DNS which means you're, uh, when you try and look up a site, it's actually checking to see if that site is safe or a known malware site or, or suspicious before it gives you the, 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 the information to connect to that site. Uh, just another layer to top basically command and control channels, uh, malware installation, phishing sites, because those all get blocked by this protected DNS. Um, I already talked about extending those same workstation management filtering controls to your, your users at home. You know, if they never come into the network and if, if, if that's the only way they get patches and antivirus updates, that's a problem. You need to have a way for them to get that when they're working from home. Longer logs, we talked about that. Um, managed security service provider or security information and event management system. So these both have the same function. They, they consolidate your logs and mine them for evil. Um, so they're getting your, your event logs from your domain controllers, from the Windows network, from your workstations, from your firewalls, gets all of those. And it's looking for things like, hey, this admin hasn't logged in in a year and it just logged in. Or someone just had four failed password attempts at 2 a.m., which is, is, is out of the ordinary. Um, so it mines all that data. And that's how you find these attackers, you know, that they've maybe gotten a foothold on your network, but haven't done a ransomware attack yet. You can catch them at that point with that type of service. Managed security service provider means you've outsourced that. It's a company that comes in, puts an appliance on your network that consolidates those logs, 
and they have a 24 seven um, SOC, a staffed area that's looking at those logs and calling you up uh, when something weird happened. Or a SIM is a computer that you buy yourself, put on your network, and then you've got staff that are looking at those logs every day to say, hey, the SIM tells us that there were too many failed login events. Why, why was that? Is someone doing a password guessing attack against us or something? Um, and then, yeah, a periodic testing of security controls. We see so many folks who pay for a, the new latest, greatest firewall or, or an endpoint detection response solution, but you don't have it set up correctly. You don't know that unless you test it um, and check, you know, are all the ducks in a row will actually stop the attacks. We think it should stop. Yeah, the, these last three pages for, for those of you on the call today, if you want to really understand what should our IT team be doing right now, not only is just good business practice to protect our operations, these are the pages you want. They're also the pages you want to focus on if, again, you choose to go down the route of obtaining or keeping a cyber insurance program in place, because this is what the insurance industry is looking at from a bare minimum saying at the current time, and where we're going to be in the next year to require customers to have in order to keep that insurance. All right, I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. There's a lot of questions, but I think one that's probably on everyone's mind, and if you both could kind of uh, generalize uh, if needed, but with everything that we've heard uh, about the news and what you're talking about, what can we do right now? And then um, assuming that most companies outsource some of this, how, how, much, how much should a company that's just getting into it and doesn't know what to budget for, how much on a monthly, a yearly basis to, to mitigate as much as possible within reason. You know, if they're a smaller mid-sized company, it's different, obviously, if you're a multi-billion dollar company. Um, you know, from the insurance to the team that, that Kevin would be representing, how, how, how does, I know there's a lot there, but how much would it all cost and what should they start doing and, and what's most important right now? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, the most important thing a, a, any organization can do at the current time is absolutely to start thinking about this as a exposure that is probably more likely to happen to them than their building burning down in the next 12 to 24 months. And so you need to understand your risk. You need to create a strategic game plan around how are we going to address this exposure and what are we going to do to, pre do to prepare from not only an IT defense standpoint, but an employee education and training standpoint, and really testing and evaluating going forward. You've got to understand your risk anytime there's a known exposure, and you continuously train and prepare and get better to deal with that ongoing exposure. Um, from a cost standpoint, that'll be more Kevin's world, but you know, the last thing I'll say on this, and, and I'm going to let Kevin deal specifically with that, is remember, you could spend $5 million next year on defense and, and the latest and greatest systems. And as Kevin just said, if you don't set them up correctly, it doesn't help you. But the other thing to remember is your people. Your people are always going to be your weak link. And, and I'm a huge proponent of training and education on not only phishing and social engineering, but getting your team involved with understanding how they play a role in cyber defense. Because again, if, if they're the weak link in this, you need to make sure they're involved in the training as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the cost and the effort is going to vary pretty widely for folks. But but I would say on that, you know, where you start is is going back to that doing the basics well. And a lot of those aren't, you know, it's you saw that slide wasn't you need to go buy some new expensive fancy security solution. It's you need to get get your patching up to speed. You need to get your antivirus tight. Uh, you know, multi-factor might be the, the thing you need to add that you're not already doing that, that might be some cost, some effort, but it's, it's, it's multi-factor is mature in the market. There's a lot of solutions for it. They're, you know, so they're competing with each other. It's, it's, not, it's not a burden um, nowadays, like it maybe was 10, 10 or more years ago. Um, so yeah, I think it's kind of starts with doing the basics well. Um, I also saw a number of questions here come in uh, really around passwords and multi-factor. Um, I'm just looking at this. Um, a couple of them are around like, uh, you know, sites that require A plus characters with the, the, the complexity or talking about a password manager or randomly generating passwords. And yeah, I, I didn't really talk about those, but I think 
those are definitely uh, another great solution to passwords, to use a password manager. LastPass is kind of the one a lot of folks are familiar with. Um, you know, you want one that's reputable. Uh, the cool thing about LastPass is they actually had a breach not too long ago. Uh, but during that breach, it, it came out that they were structured so well that even though their, their systems were breached, nobody's passwords were breached. Wow. Um, so that's kind of nice. So I think it, you know, an alternative to, to 20 character passwords um, is if you're using complex ones, you still need more than eight characters, but using a password manager uh, can, can other, be another alternative there. Um, and yeah, there's a note here about shared mailboxes. It's really hard to do multi-factor authentication with, with a shared mailbox. Um, people get creative with ways to do that. Uh, but most of the time, what you're really trying to do is, is have each individual have their own account, but then give their accounts right to the, rights to the shared resource. So it's not like they're sharing an account, they're just sharing the resource. So Kevin, I know you got to go in two minutes. And yeah. uh, Jason, I got a question for you that maybe we can go just a few minutes beyond two. Yep, we're um, good. Uh, for, for what you do, let's say there's a there's a breach. If you have insurance, it's 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 you know you get the the, the, the higher end service, and if you don't, just give us give us a range. Is it is it is it tens of thousands? In, in just ge in generalities, you know the exposure that that a company has if 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 there is a breach. You know from from kind of the the lower end of what you've seen to the higher end of what you've seen. In cost is that one to Kevin or me? Yeah, to yeah. Kevin, to Kevin, because you're different from what what Jason has. You know, it's 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 really all over the place. The attackers, the attackers from a ransomware uh, ask, uh, are generally asking, you know, what they think your cyber liability policy will pay, or what your what your losses for the next three days to cover that. But it's it's you know, typically it's 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 seldom that we see a five figure. It's usually a hundred thousand dollars into the millions is pretty pretty normal for the ask. Uh, and then for response, again, it depends on the size, the complexity, the amount of effort we're doing, but uh, you know, it starts in the, the 20, 30,000 just for the basic like time it takes to figure out what happened and, and is this, the network tight now. Right, and, and the more complex and, and the bigger yeah. the, the risk or loss, the obviously higher it is. Okay, and then, uh, and I know you gotta go, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, Jason, uh, yep. give us give us yep. a range. You talked about where things see it, Kevin. Thanks so much. Uh, you gave us a, a thought of you know when cyber insurance first started out, and now it's changed with a multi-factor authentication and and many more requirements. Where do you see this in five years? How do you see that um, uh, uh, impacting premiums, deductibles, and you know throw throw in the home? You guys touched on it. Throw in the home the work at home uh, hybrid scenario which increases you know the the exposure you said they're paying out 160 dollars to a dollar 60 for every dollar that they took in that's not a, a model that's going to last long uh, where do you see this going so the companies in attendance can kind of plan for it yeah this this unfortunately so i mean it's so lucrative from the criminals aspect they do it there's a reason they do it right it, they make a lot of money not only for their nation states but for the organizations um, it's very lucrative. And so they're going to continue to do that. Um, we are in a world right now where more and more businesses are adding technology, they're adding automation, they're adding controls in place um, that make them produce things quicker and faster and in a more automated world. That's just going to continue to attract more threat actors to go after their businesses. So the, the quick answer, and if you look at the actuarial studies, again, as I talked about earlier, it's only forecasted to continue on an exponential growth. So where we go, the insurance industry has made the decision that we need more controls in place. We have to better pick the risks that we're willing to insure. So as while, while none of this is fun at the current time for customers to be forced into multi-factor authentication, endpoint detection, more backups, right? That's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. In some cases, it's money. Nobody likes doing that, but you're fortifying your operation. It's no different than if you had a, a your, your building was a frame structure uh, that was non-sprinklered and you stored tires and motor oil, right? That's a that's a risk that if you have a fire, the whole place is going to burn down. And historically, the insurance industry would have said, okay, you need to protect that building better, right? You need to sprinkler the building. You need to protect your, your, your building with a more robust system. You need to separate your uh, commodities. 
that's what we're doing now in cyber is that we're going to force customers to have better controls, which will ultimately, the goal is lead to less frequency of loss. If you make it harder for a bad guy or girl to attack you, that's the goal with these, these requirements. And so, you know, the long story short is if that doesn't work, you're going to see a, a world of chaos, right? Much like, you know, potentially earthquake or hurricane insurance or terrorism, where it's got to go to a federal fund. And that's, that's not what anybody wants right now. So there's a reason these controls are being requested of customers to, to make it harder for the criminals to gain access to your organization. And to maintain some time type of affordability, probably, until right. it gets too out of hand where it's just not possible. Yeah, I mean, and so to, to kind of piggyback, it's a great point to piggyback off what Kevin was saying, you know, so Kevin, you know, Kevin's firm said it was, you know, going to be twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 just to show up on site, right? They haven't even started the hourly billings, right? And this is just remediation. Think about this from when you have that situation where Monday morning, we keep going back to this and your computers are locked, your systems are down, you've got a ransom demand, you're going to incur several hundred thousand dollars just in expenses from the teams that are gonna be brought in to figure out what's going on. How do we get to the systems? How do we get to the backups? How do we recreate the data? That's just the initial expenses. We haven't even talked about loss of production, brand reputation, loss of income, uh, ransoms, right? So now as we talk about when everybody says, well, why are premiums going up so high? Because what used to be a couple hundred thousand dollars was your bad day. Now a couple hundred thousand is just the starting point. And if you get a ransom on top of that, that you have to pay, that's why we're now seeing, you know, one, two, three, four, five million dollar ultimate payouts on these incidents and, and why the crimes have gone up so dramatically. Uh, maybe one of the second last question, talk, talk about ransom, whereas I think uh, payments, I think a few years ago, or maybe even last year, started COVID. Um, people, companies were uh, encouraged not to not to pay the ransom because the more you pay it, the more they're going to do it because they're feeding their their engine. What's the philosophy now, uh, and what are you yeah, seeing? Two two parts, right? There's there's a lot of talk in this. It's been brought up all the way in the you know in the federal government. Um, CEOs and management teams have been called in front of Congress and had to respond. Some of the big ransoms you saw last year in the news. They were brought in front of congressional hearings and had to testify as to why they chose to pay the ransom, right? That exactly what you said, it, it continues to encourage criminals to do this. Um, it's really hard for me to tell a business, you know, you can't pay this ransom, right? Because um, that's your that's your operating existence. That's how you pay for bills. That's how you pay your employees. That's how you continue to stay in operations, right? So that's a, that's a very tough uh, ideological question to, to say to somebody is that you're not allowed to pay a ransom. So I'm not sure we're ever going to get to a situation where you can force somebody to not pay it. But the bigger piece, and, and I just want to stress on this because it's it's critical, and, and you're already going to be in a, in a very flustered state when you have that happen to you. But you've got to understand the rules and regulations. You are not just allowed to pay a ransom, even if you want to. You do have to follow some legal issues and and checks of what's called an OFAC list, the Office of Foreign Assets and Control. You have to go through the proper controls and procedures in a ransom situation as an organization and your insurance company and our providers that you're working with will help you with that. But I, I stress it's so critical for people to understand this because as we see more and more ransoms, the last thing you wanna do at that time is have a ransom situation where your business is down and then also open yourself up to civil and criminal prosecution because you made the wrong decision. So um, it, it's far too too long to get into right now, but I, I just, I stress this to people that you've got to understand this. Again, I go back to my comment that anytime you have a known exposure in life, regardless of what we're talking about, um, whether it be active shooter, workplace violence, you know, old school emergency management planning for fire and tornado drills, ransoms are a very real and prevalent exposure that's in today's world. You have to have a game plan in place and understand what goes on with that before the incident occurs. And so I just, I, I, I can't stress that enough. You know, earlier I said, we're not here to scare you. I find my anger is higher than, than it's ever been as to that, that this goes on. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah, so, but it's good. To, it's good. Just leave with that thought that it's good that you're thinking about this. You have to be prepared for this, right? The more you ask questions, the more you dive into this, the more you understand and get yeah. strategic, you're going to be in a better position. 
All right, so we've exceeded our time. Any final words, um, Jason? I just appreciate everyone's time today. You know, if anyone has any questions, you're always welcome to reach out. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I know we didn't get to all the questions. So make sure you reach out to Kevin or Jason, their numbers and contact information are on here. And I know that they would uh, answer some specific questions that, that weren't answered. So this does conclude our webcast. So thanks again uh, to our presenters and partners, Jason Navarro, Director of Crime, uh, Cybercrime Insurance at r, r Insurance Services, and Kevin Bong, Director of Cybersecurity at Sikich. These are the experts. Uh, make sure you reach out to them and their companies if you have any additional questions, as I said. Please do that. Um, you know, if you're looking to, to put a plan in place to mitigate your risks of cyber of, a, of, a, of an attack. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this webcast is um, being recorded and will be available on our website later today or, or, or no later than tomorrow morning. Um, and the slide deck is available now. So we value your feedback as you uh, as we look to have more webcasts in the future. So we, we'd appreciate if you fill out the attendee survey, which will open uh, in a new tab once you close the webcast tab in your browser. So again, thanks so much. On behalf of our webcast presenters and partners, r, &R Insurance and Sikich and BT360 Content Solutions, thank you all for attending. Go Brewers. You can all go to the Brewer game now and uh, just try to stay out of the wind. So have a great day. Thanks.